section looks at, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a broad topic of empirical models in general. So we're not focusing on any one type of least squares or PCA or POS models. It both talks about using models in general. So this is a widely applicable to any of your research that you're looking at. Um, most of you do have models inside your thesis at some point. And so this is, what we're looking at here really is how you should have some portion when you use and interpret these models. We're going to look at the topic a little bit of correlation and causation. Um, I'll recap the effect of feedback control, but the main thing that you'll learn at the end of this is that to break this problem of, of empirical models, we really do need design experiments. So the famous quote that you may have seen before due to George Marx is that all models are wrong, but it's really how wrong are they before they become totally useless. And so I had a little reading up there on the website for you that I linked to a, a page. And they give a very simplistic, uh, it's, it's a little bit too simplistic uh, explanation. And in fact, there's a, there's a few criticisms about that guy's article. So if you read the, the comment threads there below the article, there's some really insightful replies to his article, um, pointing out where he's being overly simplistic. We're going to look at it a little bit more subtly, um, this problem of empirical models. We're going to look at the cases of where models are used. In the way I see it, in this course, we use models to learn more about a process. I emphasize this quite a bit. Uh, looking at loadings plots and weights plots and PLS to learn more about a process. But we also use models sometimes for troubleshooting. You build a model that contains both the good data so if you look at your X matrix, let's say you're doing a PCA, this first period contains good data, and then slowly your fault starts to happen or your problem happens, something happens in your process that everyone suddenly starts jumping around, let's try and fix this, this trouble that's occurred. If you build a PCA model of this data, as long as most of your data is good, the PCA loadings are going to go in this direction of good, and hopefully in your score plot, you'll see some sort of clustering of your bad region and your good region over here. And then you can do contribution plots to try and diagnose the, the trouble that's occurred. So we can use them for this. We can use them for making predictions. PLS would be the case that we've looked at mostly so far. We can use them for process monitoring. And we can use them to optimize the process sometimes, especially if that data in that model is, is cause and effect type data. We can definitely then use it to optimize and make improvements. So what you'll notice is that this first one here, learning more about a process, that's an offline. line. We do this on, a, on an offline data set. Troubleshooting, that model is built once or to learn about a problem. Making predictions from a model and using it for monitoring, those are online type tools. And then the fifth one, once we've optimized and made our improvements, we usually uh, don't go back and find that model. So we use these models online, offline, for various different uh, purposes as shown here. The important thing to realize is that empirical models, which are just built from a database, so we don't actually have any first principles derivations in, in, in here. We don't have PDEs that model our process to high quality. We just use an empirical model. Their trends often match the reality quite well, but the exact values won't won't match exact. That's really not too much of a problem as long as those rough values are, are in the ballpark. We can then use them for monitoring, we can use them for predictions. But the reason why we don't use these first principles models is because they're really costly to develop. Firstly, it takes a ton of time figuring out which equations to use, and then it takes even more time fitting those equations to the data to calculate parameter estimates. And, and that whole procedure has got a lot of problems with it. So sometimes it's just easier to throw that all out and let's focus just on building an empirical model like PLS or PCA to achieve our objective. But there is some risk in doing that and that's what we're going to focus on. Okay. So in order to do that, I'm going to look at this very simple data set, which will hopefully uh, uh, be easily understood by all of you. It's not a chemical data set, it's related to something you're familiar with, which is cheese. So cheddar cheese is a very small data set, 30 samples. That's, uh, you can get this data off the internet, it's, it's posted on the website as well. 
And what it is, is there's three variables that are measured. The level of acetic acid in the cheese, the level of hydrogen sulfide, and the level of lactic acid. Those cheeses are then presented to a taste panel of several judges. They sample those and calculate a taste. So low values are poor taste, high values are better tastes. And that's shown here as the fourth period. And just to make this uh, analysis a little bit more interesting, I've added a fifth variable myself. For, sorry, there's a fourth x variable I've added. This is just a random number. I just went to R and I said, give me 30 random numbers, and I added that as a new one. Okay? So up here is the correlation matrix between acetic acid, H2S lactic acid, taste, and the random numbers. So I want you to take a look at those, that correlation matrix. And I want to Take a look at that visual plot over there. And tell me how many, what do you think a PCA would do on those data? What do you Firstly, I'll go on the plus group over here, J, uh, sorry, Shivali, and you know, what do you see firstly that's interesting in that, in that data set? Just one thing that you notice that seems interesting to you. So a strong relationship between taste and lactic acid. Jake, Charlene, yes sir, anything else you notice? You said that taste is strongly correlated to all three of them. Taste is strongly related to lactic to H2S and acetic acid. Okay, so to all three, so of lactic acid, H2S, and acetic acid, there's a strong positive correlation. Max, Louis, anything else you notice? Such a strong correlation between base and acids and so even between these x variables, there's a strong correlation amongst those. Yana, Matt, Umana, anything else you notice? There doesn't appear to be any correlation between any of the variables and the random variables. Random, kind of uncorrelated between the other four variables, okay. Anything else that <laughs> we notice? All of them are positive correlations. All of them are positive correlations. And I'm re you're referring to all of these here, I presume, yeah. except for this one, of course. But all of them. All of these here. But in, in general, yeah, all of them are positive. Oh, they're all positive variables. Yeah. OK, yes, But, but there's no negative correlation. Like, none of, yeah. Um, well, there's a slight negative correlation here. But it's the random variable. Yeah, it's the random variable. But it, OK, the not random variables. Are yeah. yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so basically exclude this bottom row of this last column. Everything else, there's definite positive correlations amongst all the variables. Okay. So anything else that I've that someone else notices that hasn't been mentioned before? Okay, so now to answer that question, yeah, how many uh, sorry the PCA model on the first three X variables, how many components would you expect? Yeah. One component, and it would go in the, that direction of um, the correlation between acetic H2S and lactic, right? They're all three positively correlated, one main component to explain that variability. Okay. And would you expect the random variable to have any weight in that PCA model? So a loading, sorry, loading close to zero, perhaps, for, for that uh, random column. Okay, we have more. Yeah, such a small asset. Right. Yeah, given the small, we're not going to find it identically zero. We may find a number that's, but I, I would say relative to the other variables, it's going to be a smaller load. But, but uh, you're right, it's going to be certainly show up as some, some non zero value for sure. Okay, so that, that's, I just wanted you to get thinking about it because now we're going to look at several models. So what I've done is I, I took this data set and um, I'm I can 
I will post this uh, R script on the course website and you can go look through it at your own time and replace it with another data set and try this out on something else and you can go modify it and play around with the numbers that I've got. But what I did is I took all those 30 observations and I built a linear regression from the first three X variables, acetic, H2S, and lactic acid, and random. And so give me a prediction for Y based on those four inputs. And I got a root mean squared error of estimation of 9.4 units, which if we go look back at the taste variable, taste is a number that ranges between 0 and 50. 5, I'd say, 0 and 55. My root mean squared error is roughly a 9 point something. So it's not a good, a great model by any means, but it's certainly going to be, uh, it's going to give me trends that fit the data. R squared 65%. Then I did the test set switch, which we described last week, where you use half and half. And I used my test set one and test set two. I used observations one, three, five, up to 29. And test set two was two, four, six, eight, up to 30. Just because I had no particular um, idea of how this data was originally structured. This was, I thought, an okay test set. I could have taken 1 to 15, 16 to 30, but I didn't know if there was any ordering to the data set. So I just picked half and half interleaved like that. Calculate the prediction set for the each half based on the model for the other half, and then I report the average that is written in square error. Variable selection. How many of you have heard of variable selection or uh, stepwise regression? Stepwise regression is a tool that you'll find in some of the more sophisticated software packages. They go through and they go look at the individual variables and which ones are strongly correlated to Y on a, on a univariate basis. They'll pick that variable with the highest correlation and build a least squared model. Then they'll add in another variable with the next highest degree of correlation and they'll build the second model. And then they, they, they keep adding and switching variables around because so many combinations, right? So I've got four variables. I can build four individual models, one from each x to the y. Then I can take combinations of two variables at a time and build a model to y, and combinations of three variables at a time to y. So for a small number of columns, it's easy to do a combinatorial model building, and then you just pick the, the one with the best um, R squared or the best Square error of estimation. In this case, variable selection, uh, I didn't follow a formal variable selection, but what I did is I just went through the individual variables and I went, looked at the correlation matrix, and H2S was the column that was most strongly related to taste. So I figured I'm going to build, a, 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 I wanted a model that was just an ordinary least squares. So the first least squares model here was a multiple linear regression. I wanted an ordinary least squares, one x to one y. So I picked the x with the strongest correlation to y. So it has a coefficient of 5.8, and the confidence interval for, five, for that coefficient was 3.8 to 7.7. .7. So it's definitely a significant coefficient indicating that increasing H2S is expected to increase the taste value, uh, taste by 5.8 units. So one unit increase in H2S should boost the taste by about six units on average. Root mean squared error was a little bit higher for this model, R squared a little bit lower. The root mean squared error of prediction though on the testing data set was lower than the multiple linear regression model, slightly lower. Principal components regression, which we spoke about a couple of classes back. We showed that you can convert a principal components regression model over to uh, a model that is of the form y hat is equal to b times x. So we calculated that b is, you can calculate b by substituting the two equations into each other. So that's what I've done here. I've also, I think I took care of the fact that the x's here are centered and scaled. So I've reported the coefficients here uh, for uncentered and unscaled x's. So you should be able to just take the raw data plug them in here and get a prediction. The constant term is really not too important, so I didn't calculate that. But here we're seeing root mean squared error estimation. 
little 9.9, .9, little higher than uh, say the linear model up here. R squared 62%, root mean squared error prediction on a test set 10.6 units. And notice the PCA loading. Just remember the PCR model is a two-step model. There's a PCA first followed by linear regression. That PCA on the four X variables gives exactly what we said there earlier, what you guys said. We get high weights for the three X's because those three X's are strongly positively correlated to the uh, Y. And then there's your random numbers coefficient, 0.09 is a small weight, a small weight. That PCA model, uh, by the way, explains 72% of the variation, just with one component. So one component on those four X variables explains roughly 70 reasons. Two more models and then we're done and then we can go compare them. PLS. PLS is a single latent variable model relating x to y. Root mean squared error is now 9.4, r squared 65. Root mean squared error prediction is 10.7. So it's about in the range of, of uh, most of these other models. It's slightly worse than principal components regression, uh, but not by much, it's one decimal place. And then the weights from PC. Uh, for PLS. Strong weights on the three X variables and then actually there's a moderately strong weight even on the random number. Uh, but it's, it's it's definitely much smaller than the weight than the others. And then finally, how many of you are familiar with neural networks? One. One hesitant, two, three hesitant. So neural networks is a is a class of models where you take, um, next slide. you take your inputs into a node, and then that node takes, takes the data, multiplies it by the weight. So here, this is the weight corresponding to the input. Goes into another, into the next layer, and it takes the summation of those, that input multiplied by the weight, puts it into that, the summation of that. So that summation from all the nodes goes into a nonlinear function f, which for most neural network models, we use a nonlinear function of that type. So here's my axis, is my summation. And whatever my summation is, I put that in. So if I get a summation over here, I put that as my input to the node, and then my output, my output, I read off over here. And this number is, goes from a low value of zero to a high value of one. The main thing is that this is a nonlinear mapping. It takes whatever the summation is of those input nodes and then maps it over here on my y-axis to a number between zero and one. Uh, between zero and, one. and then it, it can add a bias term to it as well, depending on, on the value of the, of the mapping. And then that gets cascaded into a second layer of nodes. And then finally I get my taste outcome. Now the way the neural network model works is it takes all your data as input, and it knows what your output is, and it tries to back calculate what these weights should be by using a, a, a propagation algorithm. So it will go forward and then it gets an error and then it works backwards, and it goes forward and it works backwards, adjusting the weights until it reaches some convergence. And it adjusts those weights until the prediction of taste has minimum squared error. What happens with neural networks is, I'm not by any means an expert, so if any of you have got more experience with it, you can take my script and, and hopefully improve my neural network model. But the, as you can see with neural networks, is these weights, they, the algorithm starts by initializing on a set of random numbers. And depending on, your, on the initial guess, it can find different combinations of weights that can get your predictions of taste for you. And it can usually get those combinations so that the R squared explained for the training data is, is actually quite high. So here in this particular case, for neural networks, the R squared is the highest R squared and the root mean squared error of estimation is the lowest one of all the, all the models. But when we go ahead and use that model for prediction, it's got the highest prediction error. Because those complicated nonlinear functions that are used inside the net neural network here and the choice of weights 
they can be adjusted fairly arbitrarily to fit the particular training data set, but it may be um, overfitting from a testing data set, which is why the prediction errors are higher often for the overall groups. Okay, so which model works best for this data set? Which model would you select to, to use in the future? And I would, I would not answer that question with a particular answer. I wouldn't say the ELS is the way to go always, and nor is these squares always the way to go. I would say it really depends on what I want to use that model for. If I want to use that model to learn from the data, look at the various conflicting learnings I'm getting. If I go back up to this slide, just compare these three models for now. This model over here tells me if I adjust acetic acid by one unit, I should expect taste to increase by 2.2 units. This model doesn't have acetic acid in it. Okay, so maybe let's, let's compare H2S throughout the three models. This model says increased H2S by one unit will make taste go up by 3.4. This model says no, H2S will increase uh, the taste by 5.8 units. And the PFPCR says it will increase by 2.4 units. So I'm learning conflicting pieces of information from these three different models. PLS tells me uh, also 2.4 units. And my neural network model, it's really hard to interpret what the weights are. I could look at the weights for H2S, but it's really, every time I rebuild that model, I can, I can sometimes get a different weight of it. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And in fact, the particular package I used calculates uh, confidence intervals for the weights, and all my weights had confidence intervals that span zero, indicating that none of my variables are important to the model. So learning from this model is really tough, depending on the choice of model I've picked. That's very unsatisfying, right? If you're trying to learn more about your process and you're saying that what I'm going to learn depends on the model that I choose, is that, is that right? Is that, is that a good thing? Right? I mean, it, so you have to bear that in mind. There's no right answer to that. In fact, we'll talk a bit more about learning in a, in a bit um, when we look at correlation and causality. Let's take a look at troubleshooting. And um, if, we're, if I was, if I had, this one's a bit hard to do with cheese, so maybe it should, troubleshooting is really for process data and where we can structure our data with good data and bad data. So in this case, we really have no notion of good cheeses and bad cheeses. So let's, uh, let's uh, troubleshooting doesn't really apply to this data set. If we look at predictions though, to make predictions on a training, on a testing set, which model would you pick? Something, yeah. So you uh, ten point for what? What are you looking at for predictions? Like lower error. RMSE P. Yeah. Yeah. So you would pick the model that gave you lowest RMSE P. Um, in this case, principal components regression or PLS give very similar uh, RMSE P. I would pick either of those, whichever would make sense to you um, to implement this. These squares models both give higher RMSE P's than the than the latest variable. But it's not hard to find data sets where the reverse is true. I found data sets where a least squares model can give me good or better predictions by a small amount than PLS. Okay, so I'm not favoring PLS over, over linear regression. In many cases, the two are very comparable. And in fact, my experience with many soft sensor and uh, predictive case modeling is that I could pick any one of these models and I would get roughly equal performance. With the, the differences are in the decimal basis in terms of how, how um, accurate they are. From a process monitoring point of view, which of those models could you use? PLS. Could you use a least squares model for process monitoring? Yeah, for for uh, monitoring, you can only use it for monitoring the Y space. 
right? Because you're getting y hat, and then later on you get your actual y, and you can track when y and y hat disagree significantly, then you know something's gone wrong in your process that's making you cheat. But there's no way of monitoring your x variables, your levels of lactic acid, acetic acid, and H2S, okay? The last objective here is, let's look at optimization. If someone wanted to improve the taste of the cheese, we want to adjust our process so that we get a cheese with better taste. One option that you'll see it happen a lot in companies is that someone comes along, the product development specialist, and they say, we're going to try this. And they, they say, well, we're going to try a cheese with high lactic acid because you know what, lactic acid's cheap, so if we can boost the lactic acid, we know it's got a positive correlation to taste, we're gonna go ramp that up. We're gonna use low H2S and high acetic acid. Those are the properties that we want. And we're gonna set the random variable to zero. So the random variable I picked was just set it at zero originally, so we'll set that equal to zero. And we try and make a prediction from the model for this particular case that we want to get to. Multiple linear regression gives us a, a taste of 30. The H2S model with a single variable in the X space gives us 13. Principal component regression tells you you're going to get a taste of 54. PLS is 48. The neural network is 38. Which one of those do I believe? And I'm getting so many conflicting answers from, from that. And the point is here, none of them are really correct. None of those models are correct in any sense because the combination of these three X variables is very different to the combination of the X variables in the training data set. If I go look at my training data, when lactic acid is high, H2S is also high. I can't go change lactic acid independently of H2S. The relationship between lactic acid and H2S needs to remain the same for that predictive model to work. The relationship between all these three X variables, lactic, H2S, and it needs to be consistent before I can use the model to make a process optimization. Okay. And only, uh, I, I didn't have, I ran out of time to calculate what the SPD and PCR was because I was using R to do this work and R didn't have the function to calculate SPD and uh, for PCR and PLS. So I didn't have time to do that by hand. But I would definitely expect that for this new observation, if I tried to plug that in as new data, I would see a very high SPD telling me right away that, okay, I will get this prediction, but it's going to be garbage. Whereas these squares, multiple linear regression with neural networks, there's no consistency check on the input there to tell you that ahead of time or not. The, the other thing to notice here, I think I had it just coming up for the down. The other thing is when we've got these highly correlated variables, as, as it is in this case, between acetic, H2S, and lactic, what the latent variable models do, we're coming back to this idea of learning. I said I'll come back to learning here at the end. You'll see that both PCR and PLS, their weights for those three variables are roughly the same. So 0 0.46, 0 0.63, 0 0.59. And for PC, PCR, it's even more, more apparent, 0 0.56, 0 0.59, 0 0.58. What the latent variable models do is when they see three correlated variables, or a certain number of correlated variables that are related to one, they will spread the weight across all the variables. Okay? Whereas multiple linear regression will put an arbitrary amount of weight on, on different variables here. In fact, we'll see that multiple linear regression, yes, it does give us a positive coefficient for each of the three variables. But notice the confidence interval span. Here, the acetic acid spans zero. It's telling us that basically acetic acid has no effect on Y. It tells us H2S does have an effect, and that confidence interval is very narrow and, and compared to the others. And lactic acid has a positive coefficient, but that, co that confidence interval is so wide so it, it, it casts a little bit of doubt onto that. Well, if we go back at the original data, sure, acetic acid to H2S does have a bit more scatter than lactic acid, I'm sorry, acetic acid's relationship to taste, 
has, a, has quite a bit more scatter than the relationship between lactic acids uh, relationship and taste as well as H2S's relationship to taste. These two are definitely stronger relationships. But the, the point is that all three are still positive. And what PLS will do is it will spread that weight across all those three variables, roughly evenly distributed. And so the joke is always, well, PLS was developed by a Swede in their socialist country, so when it comes to spreading the wealth, they'll spread it equally across all the variables. So, um, but but that's, that's important to note, right? So whenever we have a group of very highly correlated variables, uh, you'll see that with, uh, with the lags as well, right? So we, as we have, when we looked earlier, introduced lags into the x space, lags two, three, four, five, six, we saw even though the real truth might be that it's lag three that's strongly related to y, the fact that lag two is related to lag three and lag three is also related to lag four, PLS is going to spread that, that weight over all the lags. So you're never really going to know what the true one is, even though the true one might be lag three is related to, to uh, y. In this particular example, let's say it is lactic acid that truly is the cause of taste. But because lactic acid is correlated to H2S and acetic acid, we're seeing all three variables. So even from the PLS model, we cannot tell from a cause and effect point of view which is the right one. Both, oh sorry, all three of these variables have high weight. So you would think that all three variables are related to taste. But from a cause and effect point of view, perhaps it is only lactic acid. These other two get positive weight purely because they happen to be correlated to the causal variable as well. So that, that's important to remember. Um, and, and it's a risk with interpreting a latent variable model or any of these empirical models. So the only way we could ever really infer what is a cause and, and, and its corresponding effect is by doing a design experiment. In this particular example, you would need to build uh, a 2 to the 3 factorial, two levels of three variables, acetic, lactic, and H2S. So those would be your three variables. You would vary them low and high, low and high, low and high. So you'd get eight, eight particular experiments you'd have to run. So H2S, lactic, and acetic. You go minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So a low acetic acid cheese, a high acetic acid cheese. Uh, H2S minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, <coughs> plus, plus, and then the last grouping. So create eight new cheeses with low and high levels of their corresponding acids of H2S, and then have the taste panel taste those eight cheeses and rate them on their taste. That will quickly tell you which variable is causally related to what. Because let's say it is lactic acid that is the true cause of improving taste, we will see the cheeses with high lactic acid have high taste. Cheeses with low lactic acid will get low tastes. So we'll get high, 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 low, 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 low here. And we can clearly see that lactic acid will cause an effect. Previously, we might have been uh, from the latent variable model we would have assumed, given these positive weights, that high values of lactic acid, high values of acetic acid, and high values of H2S are responsible for the taste. But this will clearly show it's not the case, because if we compare the H2S to the taste column, we'll see it doesn't match up to the corresponding taste. If we compare acetic acid to taste, it won't match up. The only column that will match is the true causal column. Now bear in mind it may not be possible to even create all these cheeses because if these three variables move up and down together, you may not actually be able to manufacture a cheese with high lactic acid, but uh, let's take this case. You may not be able to make a cheese with high lactic acid, low H2S, and high acetic acid. It may, might just be impossible. You might never be able to uncorrelate these three variables. But the only way to actually tell cause and effect is by doing a DOE. Whenever someone looks at a latent variable model and you, you 
you start to infer cause and effect, you have to be extremely cautious. The only way you can do that is if you've got good engineering knowledge to supplement your latent theory. Okay, so we've, uh, we looked at this topic of feedback control last class. So that's really all I wanted to, um, to emphasize here in this last section. It's a very small section, but it's actually very critical to understanding any type of model. So the next class, what we'll do is um, I'll, I'll just recap this idea of adaptive models. It's not really something that's part of the course, but it is. Um, uh, it depends on the timing. Next class, I may or may not take it up. If I don't take it up, there is certainly enough text in these slides so that you can read it on your own and you can email me uh, questions on it. But next class, we will look at image data analysis and how do we deal with image data, data sets.